Welcome everyone. My name is Laura Turner and I am the Executive Director of the Health Professional Student Association, who is the publisher of Student Doctor Network. And we'd like to welcome you to this webinar that we're uh, presenting with uh, Med School Coach Prospective Doctor on MCAT 101. I think it's gonna be a great webinar. There's gonna be lots of great usable tips for you. We have two experts from Med School Coach, uh, Alex Starks, who is the uh, associate director of MCAT and uh, Ken Tao, who is, uh, he's the director of MCAT. Is that correct? Great. And so without any further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to them. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to review it on demand or if you have to drop off for some reason, you'll be able to, to see a video of it. So I will go ahead and turn it over now to Alex and Ken. Great, thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, we're really excited to be able to speak with all of you, so thank you for joining us. We are gonna talk about MCAT 101, so that means we're gonna start off with the basics, really giving everyone a general sense of what the MCAT exam is about, and we're also gonna build up. So for those of you who know more about the exam, we'll provide you a lot of really helpful strategies and techniques in terms of how you should prepare for the exam. So as mentioned earlier, my name is Ken and I am the director of MCAT for Med School Coach. Prior to joining Med School Coach about three years ago to start our MCAT program, I was actually a senior MCAT instructor, instructor trainer and core content developer for the Princeton Review for about five years. So I have a pretty good amount of years of experience with MCAT test prep. So really excited to share really uh, the knowledge I have of the exam with all of you. And of course, with us is Alex. Everybody, yes, Alex Starks is my name. I'm the Associate Director of MCAT with Med School Coach. And I actually just celebrated my one year anniversary with Med School Coach. Prior to that, I worked with uh, Blueprint, formerly Next Step, as a, um, a tutor and content developer for about four years. So I've also been in this game of MCAT for, for quite a while. Great. So Alex and I really do have a lot of experience, not just with Med School Coach as a company. We personally tutor a lot of students. And for myself, I've also been a classroom instructor. So really have worked with so many students and been able to help a lot of them improve their scores. So because of that, we're really familiar with a lot of the common mistakes that students make with their MCAT preparation. So another thing that I do want to mention is that this webinar will be interactive to some degree, as in throughout the webinar, you're more than welcome to submit questions through the questions feature on Zoom. And we do have a few individuals in chat who uh, may respond to some of the simpler questions if they're more technical in nature. But uh, for a lot of those questions that are more specific to the MCAT, we're actually gonna spend the end of this presentation answering your questions. So I definitely encourage all of you to submit questions if you have them. All right, so as I mentioned, the plan for the day is we're gonna start first by discussing the unique format of the MCAT and how you can construct a study schedule. From there, we're gonna talk about the best study materials for the exam, how to effectively review, and also talk a bit about what Med School Coach offers to help students prepare for the MCAT exam. So to start off, you should all know that the MCAT has four sections. The first section is the chem phys section. Its full name is the Chemical and Physical Foundations of Biological Systems. And because of its long name, that's why most people use the abbreviation chem phys. This is one of the three science sections of the exam and it is 95 minutes and 59 questions. The second section is the CAR section, which stands for Critical Analysis and Reasoning Skills. This section is the one that doesn't require any knowledge of science content. A lot of students think of it as being similar to the verbal reasoning section on the SAT or the reading section on the ACT. And it is true to some degree in that you read passages on social studies and humanities topics and you have to answer questions about them, but you'll find that the MCAT CAR section is actually more difficult than those high school exams and really requires a separate set of strategies to do well. The third section is the bio-biochem section, also known as the biological and biochemical foundations of living systems. It is also 95 minutes and 59 questions. The last section is the psych-social section 
This is the newest section of the exam and it was introduced in 2015. It stands for the Psychological, Social and Biological Foundations of Behavior. All right, so the first thing I wanna point out is if you take a look at all of these sections, you'll notice that the exam is quite long, right? Just the testing time itself 95 minutes with three science sections, 90 minutes for cars. This also doesn't include the time that you're spending agreeing to the examinee agreement, going through the tutorial if needed, and also attending your breaks in between the sessions. Sections. So for most students, when they're taking the MCAT, they can actually expect their test day experience to be about seven and a half hours long. This is quite long and it's important to take note and that's simply because for most students at colleges and universities, the longest exam that most students will take is maybe about three hours long, and that would be for a final exam. A seven and a half hour exam, it's much longer. And something to be aware of, of course, is exam fatigue. And that is after completing a section of the exam, you're already getting tired. So after completing two or three more sections, it can be really hard for students to maintain focus and really perform well on the MCAT. So that's why one of the key things that all students need to do as part of their MCAT preparation is make sure to take multiple full length practice exams to make sure that you're able to build up the stamina that you need to maintain focus throughout the exam. Okay. So next on the top right, we have the scoring system. There are four sections of the exam and each section receives a score between 118 to 132. Right in the middle of that range is 125 and that is the average section score. This was selected intentionally by the AAMC, the creators of the MCAT exam. And that's simply because if you have a student who gets an average score in all four sections of the exam, they get a perfect 500. And that actually makes it very convenient for medical school admissions committees to determine if a student is above average, as in their scores are in the 500s, or if they're below average, if their scores are in the 400s. Okay. Next, in terms of the exam format, the MCAT is a complete multiple choice test. At first, this might bring some sort of relief to know that you don't have to do any free response. You don't have to write any essays. But it's not that simple. As it turns out, the MCAT is actually pretty creative. The question writers have come up with really tricky ways to test the same science content, but in a multiple choice format. The next thing to note is that while well, it's a multiple choice test, every question is worth the same amount of points. So that means there is no benefit to spending more time on more difficult questions if you have simpler questions that you have not completed yet. And also worth noting, there is no guessing penalty. So when you take the MCAT, you should never leave a single question blank. All right, and something else to note is that the MCAT has both passage-based questions and freestanding questions. And this is actually very important to know about the MCAT. And it's actually one of the reasons why the MCAT is considered the most difficult of the pre-health exams. And that's simply because if you compare the MCAT with the other pre-health exams, the PCAT for pharmacy school, the DAT for dental school, and the OAT for optometry school, the main difference is that on those exams, all the questions are multiple choice. And when you have, or sorry, not multiple choice, all the questions are freestanding questions. And when you have freestanding questions, it's really just, do you know the content or not, right? Do you have this fact memorized? On the MCAT, we do have some freestanding questions, but the vast majority of the questions are passage based. And what happens is, the MCAT will present to you a passage that contains new information and new situations and even new concepts that you've never seen before. And what you're expected to be able to do is apply your knowledge of science to that passage information to figure out the answers to the questions. So it's really this passage-based component of the MCAT that really makes it a challenging exam for students. Last thing I wanna mention about the MCAT in general is that the MCAT is offered between the months of January through September each year with the exception of February. 
right? So you can take the MCAT in January or any month between March through September. And for each month that the MCAT is offered, there are multiple test dates available. So that means you can really take the MCAT just about any time of the year with the exception of the fall. The MCAT is not offered in October, November, or December. So that's something good to keep in mind if you're trying to figure out when you want to take the MCAT. All right, so now that we have a pretty good idea of the exam format, let's now talk about what is a good MCAT score. You'll recall in the previous slide that I mentioned that the average MCAT score is a 500. As you might expect, an average MCAT score is not quite enough to get you into medical school. Uh, it is for some students, but for many students, it's not quite enough. So here we have some data from the AAMC, and this is the most recent set of data, and it's a GPA MCAT table. And what this tells you is for different GPA and MCAT combinations, what percentage of students with those statistics were accepted to medical school. So you can see, for example, if I have a student who has, let's say, a GPA of 3.7, so between 3.6 and 3.79, and they end up with a 508 MCAT score, so between 506 to 509, 46.4% of those students were accepted to medical school. And I should note that this is specifically for allopathic or MD medical schools. For those of you interested in osteopathic medical schools, the numbers are slightly different. And it should come as no surprise that the higher your MCAT, the higher your GPA, the higher your chances are of getting into medical school. You can see here that if you're at the highest range of uh, an MCAT score of 517 or higher, a GPA greater than 3.79, that 86.6% of those applicants were accepted. At the same time, you'll notice that it's not 100%. And that's simply because applying to medical school is not simply about the numbers. The medical school admissions committees will often use the term holistic in terms of how they review applicants. So that means in addition to reviewing your GPA and MCAT, they'll also take a look at your personal statement, your activities descriptions, your letters of recommendations, and evaluate your extracurricular activities and experiences, including volunteer, research, leadership, and clinical. So again, we are talking a lot about the MCAT today, which is important, but it's also not everything when applying to medical school. Another question that I often get is, if I have a low GPA, can I make up for that with a high MCAT score? And also vice versa, if I have a high GPA, can I get away with a low MCAT score? And the nice thing is you can actually take a look at this table and see. So if you look at this table, if you are a student with a very high GPA, we know the average MCAT is about a 500. So, you know, if we were to go slightly below a 500, even 498, 499, you can see the percentage is around a 29.7%, which isn't fantastic. If you look instead at GPA, the average GPA of applicants to medical schools, allopathic medical schools, is close to a 3.6. So if we're going below average, so this would be a student with a GPA between 3.2 to 3.39. If we go to the highest MCAT scores greater than 5.17, you'll see we're looking at 56.7%. And that's considerably higher than 29.7. So the point is that a high MCAT can help compensate for a lower GPA. And it does so better than a high GPA compensating for a low MCAT. So for those of you, if your first few years of college were a bit tough and you weren't able to perform as well as you wanted in your college courses, the MCAT is really a way for you to turn things around and demonstrate to medical schools your academic potential. Okay. The next thing I wanna talk about is MCAT timeline and how to build a study plan. And we're gonna start with the basics. The first is plan out your coursework. For those of you who are freshmen and sophomore, this is extremely important. And that's simply because having spoken with a lot of pre-medical students who are looking to take the MCAT, a lot of students 
actually don't recognize all of the courses they need to take for the exam. And the unfortunate news is a lot of them find out too late. They want to take the MCAT and then they realize there are courses they haven't taken yet that they really need to take in order to do well in the exam. So on the slide, I have a list of the MCAT prerequisite courses. And it's not a huge surprise, right? It's very similar to the requirements to apply to medical school. We've got general chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, biochemistry, biology, intro psych, as well as intro sociology. The course that I really wanna highlight here is biochemistry. And the reason why I wanna highlight biochemistry is simply because there's sort of a lot of misconception here with biochemistry. And part of it is because of the recent change to the MCAT in 2015. Although at this point, it's not so recent, but the main thing you should know is that before the MCAT went through its major revision to its current form, biochemistry was barely tested on the MCAT. So there are a lot of physicians as well as older medical students and residents who have this idea that pre-medical students don't need to take biochemistry for the MCAT. That's very much not the case. What I'll actually tell you is biochemistry is the second most tested natural science subject on the exam after biology. So what that means is there are more biochemistry questions on the exam than there are general chemistry questions, organic chemistry questions, or physics questions. So if you want to do one well MCAT, taking biochemistry will really help you. The only challenge there is that at a lot of academic institutions across the country, there's usually a sequence that students are expected to complete the chemistry courses. For example, you often have to take general chemistry one before you can take general chemistry two, and you have to take general chemistry two before you can take organic chemistry one, and you have to take organic chemistry one before you can take organic chemistry two, and you have to take organic chemistry two before you can take biochemistry. So in that situation, a student has to take chemistry every single semester uh, just to be able to take biochemistry in five semesters. So for students who decide to take a break from chemistry, that can really delay when they're able to take biochemistry and possibly when they're able to take the MCAT as well. And I do wanna note, this is not the case for all institutions. There are some institutions that only require a semester of general chemistry or organic chemistry and others that will also allow you to take some of these courses concurrently. For example, taking biochemistry at the same time you take organic chemistry too. But the main thing, biochemistry is very important. And as much as possible, if you're able to take all these classes, it will make your life easier when you're studying for MCAT. And that's simply because instead of learning the material for the first time on your own, you simply have to review the material. Okay, number two you want to select a test date that will give you ample time to focus on the exam. The MCAT is not a test that you can take without specific preparation for the MCAT. I do know that for a lot of students, when they think of standardized exams, they think, oh, this is not an exam that I need to prepare for. I just, you know, I've taken these courses. Let me just take the MCAT. The MCAT does not work that way. If you choose to do that, there's a good chance it's not going to go very well. So, here, there's this number that's often thrown around that the average pre-medical student spends 300 hours studying for an MCAT. That just gives you a bit of an idea of the scale of how many hours that students often put into their MCAT preparation. 300 hours is quite a lot. If you're studying full time, for example, over the summer, you can complete 300 hours of studying in couple of months. And some students do do that. They like to cram for the MCAT over the summer. Or you can study part-time during the school year and maybe study for the MCAT over a four to five month period. That works too. But I also want to mention that if this number is for the average student, the average student does end up with a 500 on the MCAT. All right, and if you want a higher MCAT score, that means there's a decent chance that you might need to study more for the exam. And just to give you a few examples, at Med School Coach, we have MCAT tutors that help students study for the exam. And our MCAT tutors have all done exceedingly well in the MCAT, but a lot of our MCAT tutors have told us 
that they have spent over a thousand hours preparing for their own MCAT exams. So this 300 hours isn't like this box that you check off. If you study 300 hours, you're good to go. For some students, it's good enough. You can get the score that you want. But for other students, they might need more than 300 hours to reach their target score. All right, number three, design an effective MCAT study plan. I'm not gonna go through this super thoroughly now and that's because Alex is going to discuss a lot of this. And the main thing I just wanna say is an effective MCAT study plan needs to be comprehensive. There's a lot of situations where I talk to students and they make mistakes. They'll often do important things for the MCAT, but just are missing key components. So an example I'll give you is a student that I met that purchased a whole bunch of practice exams and practice questions. And their study plan was to complete 100 practice questions every day from the first day they started studying until test day. And that sounds very admirable. They're definitely putting a lot of time and effort to complete 100 questions and review 100 questions. The main problem though is that the student had been following the study plan for about three to four weeks and just was not seeing progress. And that's simply because doing practice questions alone is just missing a huge component of MCAT preparation and that is content review. If you don't spend time doing a comprehensive review of the content, then chances are when you do questions, you're just gonna miss a bunch of questions. So what I tell students is, yes, it's true, doing practice questions is important, but you don't wanna sacrifice one part of your studies for another, right? It's not like you're doing practice questions in place of content review. You want to do both. You want to do content review, you want to do practice. And of course, there's a lot of details of how exactly you should do that content review and how exactly you should complete and review practice questions, which we'll discuss in more detail later in this presentation. Last thing, take the MCAT early enough to submit your medical school application early. If you have not heard this before, you're gonna hear it many, many times as you proceed towards applying to medical school, and that is you want to submit your application early. It is well known that between two applicants with the same exact applications, if, they, if one applicant applies late in the cycle and the other one applies early, simply by applying early, that early applicant will have higher chances of getting into medical school than the late applicant. So in terms of timeline, the application process really begins in May for allopathic medical schools and uh, really you know, kicks into gear uh, in June and July with secondary applications and interview invites rolling in. And of course it will continue through that entire year. If you wanna make sure that you're among the first batch of applications reviewed by medical schools, it's generally recommended that you take the MCAT by April or May of that year that you want to apply. You can of course take the exam earlier. There are plenty of students who will take the MCAT the summer before or in January, but the key thing is you don't want to run into a situation where you decide, oh, let me take the exam in September and also apply to medical school because at that point, your application will be very seriously delayed. Okay. So hopefully that gives everyone a pretty good idea of the MCAT timeline. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Alex, who's gonna tell you more MCAT study strategies. Definitely, thanks Ken. A lot of sage advice in, in your words. Um, so I wanted to start off talking about some really common mistakes. Some of these are mistakes that I made when I was preparing for the MCAT and others are just very, very common mistakes that I've seen in the students that I've, that I've worked with. And so the first, first one is not practicing enough. And I wanna be careful here because um, Ken made a fantastic point where you don't want to just do practice questions. He gave a great anecdote for that. And so they're almost separate phases. Like you wanna be able to spend enough time really going through the content, relearning the, the really rusty gen chem and orgo and um, foundational biology, and then move into in a time or a phase where you're applying those, where you're you're looking at questions, you're trying to answer them, and then you're reviewing. So lots of lots of practice is certainly 
certainly required for um, being successful in the MCAT. The next one thing I wanted to talk about was practicing, practicing questions without timing yourself. And this actually expands to uh, doing practice questions in a setting that is not similar or in a manner that is not similar to what you'd see on your actual exam. So that could be um, looking up uh, definitions or little facts that you forget while you're doing practice questions. Uh, that is not, go you're just going to fool yourself that you're doing better than you are. So you don't get a very realistic sense of, um, sense of how you're improving. But as far as the timing goes, I, I actually kind of hope everybody um, here ha when you're preparing has the experience of doing a section exam or even a full length where timing really gets out of control. And you're, you look back when you review the test or the section exam and realize that ah, you missed maybe 15 questions because you just didn't get to those questions. That will provide an opportunity to be really self-reflective and think about how you can manage your time and also gives you the experience of being behind and thinking of strategies or, or ways to like catch up if you get behind. So that's why timing yourself during practice is super important. The next uh, thing I wanna talk about was going overboard. There are so many MCAT resources out there and a lot of them are pretty high quality for sure. Um, it's almost, what do they call it? Fear of missing out. Yeah, FOMO. That's one of the, the things that we see is um, you, all of your, your pre-med friends or if you go onto the internet and look at all of the resources that people who've been really successful are using, you want to get your hands on those. But people can be successful in the MCAT using almost any combination of resources. And what I think is really important is just to pick a few solid, maybe a solid uh, prep book, um, and then a solid source of questions. And of course, the double AMC questions at the end. I think that would, that would be enough for most students and much better than trying to use all of them. So this, the next one, uh, expecting a score not seen on your practice exams is something that is really important. And you just, you wanna be real with yourself. There's nothing wrong with pushing your test date back or tempering your expectations um, with what your goal score will be if your double AMC practice tests just aren't where you want, just aren't where you want. And that's, again, that's okay. It's just the reality. And so you need to make the, make the decision of, okay, my, my goal score is a 515, do or die. And your practice exam scores are looking more like a 510. Well, as we looked at the chart that Ken showed, a lot of 510s go to medical school. So is that a good score that you're going to be happy with? Or do you want to push it off so that you can work on your weak areas in order to actually get to that goal score? So confidence and stamina. I'm not sure which one's more important. Um, I think they're both very, very vital, but the stamina of sitting through 230 questions, and that doesn't even take into account all of the passages that you have to read. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of words that you have to read on an MCAT. So just taking them one at a time and building up, I think also during your, your practice phase, trying to do smaller amounts of timed questions and building on that in, into section exams. So maybe you just do a chem phys um, exam and then next week you build up and do a chem phys and cars together and then and so on and so forth where you're able to do an entire an entire exam without getting, well, with getting reasonably tired because it is, it is quite a long time. Psych and Soch is probably a, a, the best example of the, the stamina and the confidence really because at, once you get to that section, you've been testing for hours. Um, yes, you have a you have a lunch break, but you're still going to be really tired. And that section is where I see my students lo uh, leaving a lot of gettable questions on the table simply because they're tired, or that they start they've started losing focus there. And so, my suggestion is to really work on mindfulness during the exam, and not only that, but outside of the exam. So I suggest to a lot of my students to download a some app, there are a ton, a ton of them that help them with meditation. And you just, you do that as part of your kind of your study warm up maybe every day so that you, you start to gain the skills and the techniques to bring your focus back in at once you see it starting to wander during, during some of these questions. So that is, that's a, my, probably my best advice for building the stamina and the focus is uh, to, to practice meditation. 
So third-party resources, there are quite a bit of those and they, they vary in quality. Um, I'm sure you could go on to any sort of message board and there are a million and one uh, opinions about all the various resources. The important thing to, uh, to keep in mind is that the AAMC, they make the test. They are the gold standard. So if, you're ever, if you ever find yourself trying to evaluate whether or not a third-party resource is quality, how you do that is you compare it to the AAMC. Like, is this good? Like, is it, does this match the kind of the logic and the feel of the questions and passages that you see with the AAMC? Because those are certainly the most important. The full length practice tests, they have five. They have four that are scored and they have one called the sample test. Now the sample test is a fantastic full length. They just don't give you a score at the end, that's it. They just tell you how many questions you get correct out of you know, 59 or 53, depending on the section. But so you still have five that are, are gonna be good quality. The only drawback of all of these full lengths is they don't test everything that the AAMC could test. And you might think after five exams, like surely they've gone through all of the different things that they ask you, but there's just quite a bit. They go through the high yield stuff very, uh, very frequently in all of the exams. Um, but that's where some of the other AAMC resources come in. One would be, that's not on the on this slide, it would be the question packs. And those, those test a lot of content. Um, I won't go into too many details just for the sake of brevity, but a lot of content that may, may or may not sh also show up on the full links that we have, or the AAMC has. The next, the other uh, resource is the section banks. And those are, if anybody has delved into the AAMC materials and looked at the section banks, you'll know that these are hard. They are very hard, but they're a really good opportunity to see like what the, really what the worst thing that you could, that could be thrown at you on testing looks like. And as long as you learn a lot coming away from those section banks, you're gonna be, you're gonna be perfectly fine. And so certainly the only way to develop your gut instincts here for the RealCat is to practice in that official style. And a lot of this, and I'll talk about this in a moment, but is the review of those questions. So you can, you can develop your instincts, your intuition of how the questions are being asked, what really the test maker wants from you. And that's the only way to do that is to actually sort of dive into the AAMC materials and sort of marinate yourself in that, in that world of, um, of MCAT. So practice and review. This, in my opinion, is what is the make or break part for MCAT. You can be a whiz at all the content. You can do a bunch of practice and hopefully improve. But if you're not reviewing the practice that you do very, very effectively, you're really just doing yourself an injustice. So uh, practice makes perfect. Now that's a that's a quote that's a little bit misleading. I don't know if anybody's ever heard, a, um, it's practice doesn't make perfect, only perfect practice makes perfect. I always thought it was my, my old saxophone teacher that came up with that, but turns out Vince Lombardi, the, the famous football coach, uh, coined that phrase, and it's really true. And so what that means is doing your, your practice under time conditions, under conditions that are like the testing, and then reviewing them very thoroughly, really digging in. Um, I'm going to get to that in just a second, but I first want to talk about how you study during content review phases and then after content review. So of course, during your content review, you want to really engage with the text maybe, or your textbooks, whether they're Kaplan, Princeton, Next Step, really any sort of, any books that is going to be just fine. They're going to cover all the content. And you can supplement that with videos from Khan Academy or your favorite YouTube um, channel and really just dig in and engage that content. But then afterwards, reviewing is going to be spot review. The questions are really gonna reveal whether or not you learned it adequately going through content review and your time reviewing during the sort of the practice phases is going to be just you know, cleaning up the areas that, that you didn't quite get. Looking for patterns is going to be something that everybody will improve by doing. And so the content based that will really just kind of show you where you need to spend more time going back to the textbook and, and whatnot. The logic based is probably a little trickier to improve on because you have to address your own thought process. You have to look at, oh, I, I didn't understand that's what they were asking from you. Like, how do I understand that, um, 
this was the logic that I was supposed to use. And looking at explanations and really spending time looking at it and um, analyzing it and comparing it to other questions, you'll, you'll get there. You'll see the logic-based errors and you'll see how to fix those. And then the silly mistakes. Now the silly mistakes, um, I, there was definitely a temptation to brush them off. It's like, oh, I didn't read the question correctly and I got it wrong. Well, I'll read it well next time. It's not really the case in my experience. Those are the type of mistakes that um, you really need to address and make a plan on fixing. Because if, if you misread a question or, or make a, you know, kind of like a technical error and it's not content, it's not logic, well, it's a big threat because you're probably going to read another question or misread for that matter, another question the same way. So it's always important to, again, to make a plan uh, to think about how could I have answered that question the first time around. So for reviewing, it's really important to review correct and incorrect answers. Some examples here, are like what's the kind of like the the flow of your thought or the pathway of your thought that got you to the wrong answer? Like, did you fall for the trap? Because um, there usually is a trap. Um, and if you do get a question correct, don't assume that you know, that like you're a whiz on that question now and that you, you definitely, that you definitely have it. Make sure you understand exactly how to get to that correct answer. And if you have the time, of course, like making sure that you know like why the wrong answers are, are going to be wrong. Because a wrong answer on a practice exam could actually be a correct answer on, an, on a real MCAT if the context is just a little bit different. So this last point um, about being honest with yourself um, going through prep. This is something I have seen uh, a lot of my students struggle with because they want to do so well on the MCAT. And I understand, that. I definitely understand that. But if you're, if you're not doing well on your practice, your practice exams and your practice questions, you just wanna pause and try and figure out how to correct it. Again, if it means you have to push your test back a little bit or you have to um, reach out for help for like uh, like tutoring or going to like help in, at your school or something like that in order to get just a little bit more support there. There's nothing wrong with that because at the end of the day, the whole point is to do well on your MCAT so you can go to medical school, be a doctor and you know live happily ever after. All right, great. So uh, lots of awesome tips there. So the next thing that we're going to go over are some of the ways that medical coach is helping students prepare for the MCAT. And the first thing I want to mention is this mobile application that we've created, and this is called MCAT Prep by Medical Coach. Uh, you can find it in the App Store on iOS devices or the Google Play Store and Android devices. And the first thing I'll mention is that this mobile app is completely free, right? There's nothing that costs money in this app. Everything is free. And it's really this fantastic application that we've created uh, to allow students to be able to study for the MCAT wherever they are. So what you'll find in this app is we have hundreds and hundreds of videos covering important MCAT science content that they that students need to know for the exam. And these lessons are broken down into short clips. So most of them are between five to 10 minutes long. So it's not a two to three hour lecture that you're sitting through. So it's very helpful if there are certain topics that you want to review. And even better is for each video, we have flashcards, questions, and lecture notes that go with them. So there are flashcards to help you memorize the key terms associated with each videos. There are questions to test yourself on the knowledge covered in the videos. And there are also lecture notes if you want to read about that topic in more detail. And something that's also very cool is this app also has the schedule feature. So it's able to put together a study schedule for you. So that way, when you open the app, it tells you, oh, these are the videos you need to watch for the day. These are the questions you should complete. So it's a really cool mobile application that we've created. It's completely free. So we highly encourage all of you to go ahead and download this MCAT prep app. All right. The other thing I want to talk about is one-on-one -on -one MCAT tutoring. So one-on-one -on -one MCAT tutoring is something that Med School Coach also offers. And it's actually something that most students aren't familiar with. And the main reason why is because if you think about your education, really from elementary school all the way through college, students really 
rarely have any sort of one-on-one -on -one instruction. You're almost always in a classroom setting with a group of other students, and it is an instructor with a whole bunch of other students. Uh, this is certainly the case through middle school, high school, and college. And at some colleges, depending on how large your university is, you might have classes with as many as 30 students to 700 students in one class. And what you typically find is that when you go to these classes, they give you a syllabus, and this is a syllabus that you have to follow, and this is the same syllabus for everyone. You're just essentially being put through the same program as everyone, but the thing is that kind of learning doesn't work the best for everyone, and that's simply because it's not personalized to your strengths and weaknesses, and this is the main advantage of one-on-one -on -one MCAT tutoring. When you work with an MCAT tutor, they're able to discuss with you your different strengths, weaknesses, and goals, and they're able to craft a study plan for you that allows you to focus on your areas of weaknesses and for your strengths, how you can raise those strengths even farther. So that's the first thing I want to mention. The second thing that's nice about a tutor is what I call next level proficiency. A lot of students, when they take their classes in college, there are certain subjects that they feel more comfortable with. They just understand them better. There's always some topics they never understand very well. For a lot of students, it might be acids and bases in general chemistry. It might be reaction mechanisms in organic chemistry, or maybe topics like circuits or optics and physics. There's always some topics that students don't feel as comfortable with. And when you're preparing for the MCAT, you can spend a lot of time on your own reading MCAT books or watching MCAT videos, trying to figure it out, but it can take you a lot of time. It can take you a lot of hours. Whereas if you work with an MCAT tutor, they can just teach you that content in minutes. So it can really save you a lot of time. And at the same time, give you a really advanced mastery of the content you need to know through exam. The next thing is study plan design. There are so many students that they know that MCAT is really important, but they just have no idea where to start. So a nice thing about working with an MCAT tutor is because your experience is completely personalized. And that also includes your study plan. So when you work with a med school coach MCAT tutor, they will put together a comprehensive study plan for you. It's mapped out on a calendar. So that way you know exactly what you need to do for each day of your studies from the day you begin working with med school coach until test day. And this is MCAT tutoring, but I also want to mention a few additional reasons why you might want to choose med school coach over, for example, some other tutoring companies out there. The first thing is, we have the best tutors. If you simply go to the Med School Coach website, if you look at our team of MCAT tutors, if you read their bios, you'll just be so impressed by how accomplished our MCAT tutors are, the MCAT scores that they have achieved. And that's not it, right? We know that there are a lot of students who are really bright who can take exams and get great scores, but not all of them are effective educators. Not all of them are good at communicating their knowledge of science and test taking strategies to students. So when a student wants to be a tutor for med school coach, we put them through a very rigorous training process. And this training process really serves as a final interview for us where they have to prepare content review lessons, strategy sessions, and present them to us and we will evaluate their teaching abilities, provide them feedback so they can improve their teaching skills. And if they're not able to meet our requirements for an excellent MCAT tutor, we don't end up hiring them. So the nice thing is when you work with an MCAT tutor from med school coach, you really know that this is a great tutor. And of course, if you think about the name med school coach, we're not just a tutoring company we help students with every aspect of becoming a physician. So that begins with taking the MCAT, but also continues into applying to medical school, helping you to write your personal statement, putting together your activities descriptions, helping you select a school list, helping you prepare for interviews. And once you get accepted to medical school, we also do medical school tutoring. So helping you prepare for the board exams and 
for students getting close to completing medical school, we also help medical students with residency applications. So we're really the only company out there that helps with every aspect of becoming a physician. And that's one of the reasons why our clients keep coming back because we help them with the MCAT, they come back and want help with applying to medical school and they just keep coming back. And the last thing I'll mention is we're a pretty small company. Most of you probably didn't, uh, haven't heard of medical coach until today. And that's actually very common because we're nowhere close to the size of the large companies out there like Prince Nearview, Kaplan, uh, Blueprint and so forth. But we actually considered that an advantage. And that's simply because here today, we're able to come speak to you as the ones that are leading our MCAT program, we're here to speak with you. If you have a presentation from uh, some of those larger companies, the odds that you can get their director of MCAT to give this presentation is not very high. So, you know, with Mental Coach, you have access to all of their expertise you need to do more of the exam. And if you need extra convincing, I do want to point out that we have a satisfaction guarantee, which is for any student who works with Mental Coach, if they do a couple hours of tutoring with us, besides it's not working out, we're more than happy to give a refund. Second, practice. Our tutors help students with anything they need to know from MCAT. So this includes going over advanced content topics, helping you break them down, as well as teaching strategies. And this is more for students that feel like they understand the science content pretty well, but more so want help with the strategy component of the MCAT. And the last thing, which is perhaps the most important thing here is we've had incredible success with our MCAT program. If you look at our website, you'll see that the average score improvement for our students is anywhere between 10 to 12 points. And the reason why there's fluctuation is simply because as we collect more data, sometimes we have students that improve more, sometimes students who improve less, but it's always between 10 to 12 points, which is a big improvement for most students. Okay. So that's a lot of the content that we had structured for the presentation today. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we're now going to take this time to answer your questions. So I can see in the questions feature that we have a number of questions here and uh, we're definitely going to answer them. But I also want to encourage those of you, if you have not submitted any questions yet, you're more than welcome to do them that now and we'll begin going over these questions. So the first question, Alex, I think you can help with, it is, can you self-study biochemistry if you have taken general chemistry one and two and organic chemistry one? If so, what are the best resources to use to self-study? That is a great question. So it's, it's not ideal um, to self-study for biochemistry, but if you are strong in gen chem and orgo, you are uniquely situated in order to do so. And because most of biochemistry, at least in, in my view, is sort of applied general chemistry and applied organic chemistry. There are some new things, especially metabolism, that's a lot of memorization, but all of the different reactions are things that you learn in organic chemistry and the acid-base aspect of amino acids and proteins and all those kinds of things. You learn the, the fundamentals in um, general chemistry. So if you're in a situation where you just, you have to do that. Uh, my suggestion would to would be to definitely get a textbook, a biochemistry textbook, because you're going to be able to get more, more nuance and a better explanations than just a, like an MCAT prep book, even though that potentially could be sufficient. The other thing I would suggest is to find a, um, I'm trying to remember the, the one that I would recommend, but there are a number of like biochemistry, essentially free courses online and on YouTube that you can go and watch lectures from university professors and see all of that information. It's just, it's going to be really hard. Um, so it, it's doable, but it's not going, it's not ideal. All right. So the next question I'll be glad to take, it is, what resources are good for content review? What are the high quality solid MCAT resources, the prep books for content review, as well as strategies? 
So the first thing I'm going to mention is it's not the MCAT resources that are going to allow you to succeed on the MCAT, right? It's not like if you use this set of MCAT books, it's going to guarantee you this score, right? And that's simply because there are so many different MCAT companies out there that have written MCAT books. You know, some of the largest companies that students use the most often include the Princeton Review, Kaplan, Exam Crackers, Blueprint. There's all these different sets of books. But what I'll tell you is there are students that have used all of those different sets of books out there and have gotten great MCAT scores. There are also plenty of students who have used all of those different sets of books out there and gotten bad MCAT scores. So at the end of the day, it's not really the set of materials that you use for MCAT preparation. It's more so how you use those materials. As in, if you have a set of MCAT books, don't just you know leave them on a shelf and collect dust, right? You do need to read those books. And by read, I don't mean simply skim, right? So there are some students that will open an MCAT book and they'll basically just flip through the pages, look at the topics and be like, oh, I, I remember this topic, I'm good to go. And they just keep flipping the pages. If you want to be comprehensive with your content review, you do need to make sure that you read through the books really cover to cover. Just be very thorough. And if you think about it, if there are topics in the books that you understand well, then the reading will only go fast, right? It will go quickly and it won't take you that long. However, for most students, they find that there are a lot of topics that they had forgotten, or there are a lot of topics that they just never learned in their college courses. So really by taking a comprehensive review of your MCAT content books, that will help you a lot. In terms of practice, we mentioned this earlier, Alex really emphasized this, the AAMC practice materials are the most valuable practice materials out there. The AMC, they have a lot of practice. It's about 150 hours worth of practice and review for students. For a lot of students, that's actually plenty. So you don't, you might not even need another source of practice. However, there are a good number of students where they want more practice and they do benefit from more practice. So in those cases, it's the same thing. You can go to some of the third party companies to use their practice materials. You just need to recognize they're not as good as the AMC, but they can still be great sources of uh, MCAT preparation. And something I actually wanna mention is that Med School Coach, we are releasing our own practice exams. And Alex and I, we have a lot of experience creating practice exams for other companies. So we know a lot about the mistakes that other companies have made such that they have released exams that just aren't as good quality as they could be. So the exams that we release are going to do a superb job at emulating the exam. Okay, so the next question and uh, we'll pass this over to Alex is, when is it best to take the exam and or how soon can we take the MCAT in consideration of the date of medical school application dates? Yes, um, best to take the exam, 100% the answer to that is when you are ready. And that if it means you have to apply it like, you know, next cycle, that that type of thing, that's always my advice is whatever makes sense, whatever score you really need, um, in order to get into medical school, you have to be ready. So that being said, um, best to take the exam under the premise that you will get your goal score is probably by the end of April, because then that you'll have your score back. It takes about a month to get it back. You'll have your score back by the time that the application's open to submit for at least allopathic medical schools um, in early June. Nice. And we have another question here that I'll take. The question is, what is your advice for a non-traditional student who has a 10-year-old undergrad degree who is seeking to get a very competitive MCAT score? So uh, we've worked with a lot of these kinds of students before where they have been out of school for many years. There's a good chance that you've forgotten a lot of the science content. 10 years is a long time. So 
there's a variety of different options. There are some students that just decide, you know what, it's been too long since I've been in school. Let me go participate in a special master's program or post back program to retake some of those classes. That is one option. Of course, it can be a bit expensive to go through one of those programs. The other option, which we highly recommend, is just go with an extended study plan, right? We often hear about students who just cram and study full-time for an exam in two to three months. And it works great for a lot of students, but it's usually students who are still in school or graduated recently. So the content is still pretty fresh in their mind. If you've been out of school for a long time, I would recommend at least a six month study plan, if not a one year study plan. There are students who will study a long time for the exam. And that's simply because since it's been a while, it can it can be a little difficult to really begin studying again. Just open a set of MCAT books and see how easy it is for you to read and understand the material. And once you sort of figure out, you know, like, okay, this is how I should start studying again, then you can make progress a little bit more quickly. But the main thing I would say is make sure that you give yourself more time to study for the exam than an average student. And of course, if you're trying to start your studies and it's just not working out, looking for help is always a great option too. Okay. Alex, uh, we have another question here, and this is from a student who is asking how they can prepare for the MCAT while working full time. Yes, so this is something that I did when I prepared for the MCAT. Um, and so I'll just uh, very, very briefly give you my experience and so that maybe you can um, uh, take that in consider what your your situation is. Um, I worked full time on preparing for the MCAT, but I was really lucky where I only need to work four days a week. So I was able to do very minimal MCAT for the first or the four days that I worked just kind of reviewing some things. Um, and then the three days that I had off, I was able to really dig in and do really the same the same sort of like process that we've been talking about content review then practice uh, i did some third party practice but then dived into the double amc and in terms of if that isn't your situation and it's like a you know five to nine uh five to nine sorry nine to five during the week and you have your weekends off like most people the students that i've worked with that are in that situation they do really well with having a very good routine of starting off their day trying to do some MCAT, um, whether it's like reviewing or doing some practice problems, or if you're in the content review phase, like trying to go through one topic in the morning and they go to work, come back, they try and do a little bit more. Um, obviously you can't do six, seven hours of studying, but you know, a couple hours is great um, during the week per day. And then the weekends, they really have to prioritize making sure they get in their six to eight hours of, of studying. So as long as you're able to balance the weekly average of around, you know, probably 15 or more hours then, and go through the normal, the normal phase of content review, then practice and on uh, to your test. I think that's I think it's probably a good recipe. All right, so we have a couple of quick questions. I'll just answer real quick. So uh, one question is, have there been any adjustments as to when you can apply to medical school without an MCAT score? So when you're applying to medical school, at least to allopathic medical schools using the AMCAS application, your primary application doesn't require an MCAT score. So you're able to submit that without an MCAT score. When the MCAT score needs to come in, is when your verified primary application is sent to medical schools that most medical schools will want to see your MCAT score before they do a full review to determine whether or not to grant you an interview. We also had uh, another question here, and that is, can we retake the MCAT multiple times to get a better score, and about how often? So uh, I'll answer this one as well. The AMC does have limits as to how often that students can take the MCAT. The limits are you can take the MCAT as many as three times in one year, four times in two years, and seven times as a life li lifetime limit. Now, of course, we don't recommend students do any of these three things. If you take the MCAT in three years, three times in a year, 
four times in two years or take the seven times, you'll probably be pretty unhappy. So for most students, the ideal situation is to take the MCAT once and be done, right? Studying for MCAT is a very tedious and tiring process. If you're able to take the MCAT once, get the score that you want and be good to go, that is most ideal. So that's what we recommend. That being said, there are so many students where they take the MCAT, it doesn't go as well as they want and they have to retake the exam. That's perfectly fine. We work with a lot of students that have to retake the MCAT and that is okay. But the main thing is you don't want to plan for failure. So as Alex mentioned earlier, if you're taking AMC practice exams, if your scores are not where you want them to be, then really consider postponing your exam as opposed to let me just take the exam anyways with a plan to retake. And that's simply because if you have a lower score on your application, medical schools will see it. And that can potentially weaken your application uh, as compared to if you have a single score that is a strong score. Okay, so at this point, uh, it is time for our uh, webinar to about wrap up. Uh, I see Laura's turn on her camera, so I think she might have some words to say. Yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, both of you for a great presentation. I think it was uh, very, very useful, had some some real good actionable tips for folks. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, this presentation will or has been recorded and we will be making this available to you so that you can watch it again if there's something that you missed. Um, again, we invite you to uh, come visit Student Doctor Network uh, if you have any, uh, want to, talk with other people about how they're doing their process, as well as uh, visit medschoolcoach.com, check out uh, some of the tools that they have to offer, including their, their app. And again, thank you again to everybody who participated and have a great night and good luck with all your MCAT studying.